The last page has been turned on my most recent read. Steam is drifting up from a hot cup of tea. I know, I know. What happened to the coffee? I can hear you ask. And I am ready to tell you all about the book I've just finished. So here I am, no spoilers, opinion filled and ready to roll. All of which means it's time for the latest episode of Being Bookish. I'm your host, Ray, self-confessed bookworm, introvert, hermit, long-term depression sufferer, and ex-coffee addict. Join me on my journey through my ever-growing to-be-read pile and enjoy the latest of my 100% spoiler-free book reviews. Another week has gone by. Okay, actually not a week, (laughs) over a month if you're counting. But I had a really good reason for taking a break and I will get into that a little bit later on. But I am back from a well-needed break and I bring with me a whole series of amazing and some not so amazing book reviews. Needless to say, over my break, I got a fair amount of reading done. I read some wonderful books that I can't wait to share with you and some books that I think may be just what a few of you are looking for. Of course, everyone is different and the books we read and enjoy are just one of the ways our differences shine through. So light a few candles or perhaps just swish on that reading lamp because a bit of atmosphere is always a wonderful accompaniment to a reading session Get yourself a fresh cup of something hot or a glass of something chilled, depending entirely on when you're listening and your preference, of course. No judgment here. And let's get started. If you'd heard the number of books I looked at and discarded before I concluded that this was the right one to start season five with, you'd have likely thought I needed to get my head tested. I started with a short list of around 20 books and slowly over the course of a week realised that I needed to start as I mean to go on with a book that is placed pretty much in the middle of a series. It's neither amazing nor abysmal and stars one of my favourite literary detectives. Yes, if you know me, you've guessed it. I'm looking at another book in the Agatha Raisin series. Fear not, I do have plenty of other detectives waiting to take the reins, including Amelia Peabody and Franny Fisher. If you haven't read a book in this ever-growing series of cosy crime books by M.C. Beaton, then by the time I've told you about another one, you'll be headed to the library or your nearest bookshop to find one. Though this recommendation does come with a warning. Read them in order. Yes, this is a case of do as I say, not as I do. Because for some reason I have gone from talking about book 20 a few months ago to reviewing book 19 today. And after reading this one, I do feel that though they can be read as standalones for the mysteries that they unravel, there is an underlying plot that can be a little bit confusing if you haven't read the books in order. I know it makes no sense, but I just happened to pick this book out when I did a which book shall I read next game of One Potato and this was the one that I landed on. Agatha Raisin and The Spoonful of Poison may be a title that you're familiar with because of the TV show, but if I'm being honest here, what happens in the show bears little resemblance to what happens in this book. Of course, even though I'm reading them a little bit backwards, in that I read the next book in the series first, there is no indication in There Goes the Bride as to the plot or any of the suspects from A Spoonful of Poison. Full disclosure here, I will be talking about the extended episode of the most recent Agatha Raisin series on Acorn at times, because I think that this deserves a bit of a compare and contrast. The adaptation is incredibly different, but still manages to maintain that country village charm. Cranky but lovable sleuth Agatha Raisin's detective agency has become so successful that she wants nothing more than to take quality time for rest and relaxation. But as soon as she begins closing the agency on weekends, she remembers that when she has plenty of quality time, she doesn't know what to do with it. 
So it doesn't take much for the vicar of a nearby village to persuade her to help publicise the church fate, especially when the fair's organiser, George Selby, turns out to be a gorgeous widower. Agatha brings out the crowds for the fate, all right, but there's more going on in that innocent village fun. Several of the offerings in the jam tasting booth turn out to be poisoned, and the festive family event becomes the scene of two murders. Along with her young and, much to her dismay, pretty sidekick, Tony, Agatha must uncover the truth behind the jam tampering, keep the church funds safe from theft, and expose the nasty secrets lurking in the village, all while falling for handsome George, who may have secrets of his own. If you will recall, when I reviewed There Goes the Bride, link below, there were a few elements of Agatha's character that I felt were both incredibly insulting and also took away from the fact that she is a strong, independent woman who is both wealthy and intelligent in her own right. For some reason that I am not sure of, Beaton decided to make this Agatha a woman who was bitter about the whole ageing process, and this admittedly coloured a lot of what happened in that book. So, where should I start? Probably at the beginning, especially as I have zero intention of revealing the murderer, an aspect that changes between the series and the book, which I think you will be happy to discover, should you decide to read A Spoonful of Poison. As has already been pointed out in the book summary, it all starts with a jam tasting at a village fete, a fete that Agatha is encouraged to promote in order to raise a considerable amount of money by her good-natured friend and wife to the village vicar, Sarah Bloxby. Now, Sarah has, for some reason, a dislike for the Reverend Arthur Chance and his rather irreverent wife, Trixie, but to prove that she is the bigger person, she persuades a reluctant Agatha to do what she has always done best. Of course, she is further encouraged when she bumps into the handsome and relatively recently widowed George Selby, a charmer if ever there was one. But as always seems to be the case for Agatha, the path of true love ne'er did run smooth. For George is a man with a lot of secrets, some of which I will reveal as the story goes on, and others I will leave for you to discover, because not only will they spoil the mystery surrounding the events in Comfrey Magna, but they will also spoil the book. Everything seems to be going well for a while. Agatha's promotion of the fate has worked wonders. They have a successful musical artist lined up to take part. The event is raising money, and then one of the judges in the jam tasting dies in a rather violent manner. It appears that the jam has been laced with a particularly strong variant of LSD. But who did it? Who could possibly want the lovely and elderly Mrs Andrews to dive to her death from the top of the church tower? And why would old Mrs Jessop jump into the river? With two dead before the fate comes to a close, many blame Agatha for the awful occurrence, made more public by the presence of the press, who were there to witness celebrity Betsy Wilson performing. This is where elements of Agatha, as she is presented in the books, seems to contradict her actions. Feeling guilty and perhaps a little responsible, despite none of it being her fault at all, she offers her services no mention of a fee, to solve the mystery of the two mysterious and unfortunate deaths. What initially looks like a simple to solve cut and dried case with just a few logical suspects very quickly becomes a mess involving missing money, a questionable suicide, a cheating groom, another murder and the reopening of a cold case. Nothing, it appears, is what it seems in Comfrey Magna. No one is as nice, clean-cut or suave as they initially appear. Being completely honest, I read this after I had watched the TV episodes of the same name and I was 100% positive when I started the book that I would be able to look beyond the differences and easily pick out the murderer. <laughs> yeah, right. Is it the charming widower George Selby who quite clearly has a few secrets in his luxury car? Has the sweet and honest Reverend Ch Arthur Chance got a darker side that we have yet to see? Is the unusually named Trixie Chance the mysterious poisoner as well as a rather unlikable character? 
What about Maggie Tubby and Phyllis Tolling, who everyone in the village assumes are lesbians purely because they live together? They're definitely hiding something, but is it murderous intent? And what about the lady of the manor, Sibylla Trieste Perkins? If gossip is to be believed, she had already committed word murder once, so it's not a stretch to think she would be capable of doing it again. With so many suspects, it starts to seem as though the crime will be impossible to solve. And the story certainly keeps you involved to the very end, with twists and turns aplenty. I honestly believed about halfway through that I had pinpointed the murderer. It felt so obvious. This particular character had been written in such a way that they were too good to be true. And just when I was about to make a note in my Kindle version of the book, feeling relatively self-satisfied and admittedly smugger than I would like to admit, I was thrown another curveball. There are a lot of these in this book, but all they do is open up another path of inquiry and introduce the concept that another character could be the killer. There are motives everywhere, but it's not so convoluted that I wanted to throw the book from me in disgust and frustration, unlike There Goes the Bride. As with every book in the Agatha Raisin series, it's not only about the murderer and that's admittedly what I love about it and why even after a disappointment like There Goes the Bride, I continue to read them. Beneath the core mystery murder plot, there is something going on with James. He's being cagey and elusive and I'm not spoiling anything in revealing it's the fact that he's trying to figure out the best way to tell Agatha, his ex-wife, that he is getting remarried. Tony is in the midst of a dissatisfying relationship with Mummy's boy Bill Wong, who comes across as far less dynamic and driven in the books than in the series. Harry, who has only just been introduced in the TV series, is at Cambridge and seems to view Tony as a bit of an Eliza Doolittle to his Henry Higgins, which attacks Tony's self-confidence after she realises that Harry's interest in her is academic rather than emotional. And, as I've already mentioned, we have Agatha and her complicated love life. Her attraction to the questionable George, her past with James, and the odd relationship she has with Sir Charles Fraith that was only further compromised when she shared some intimate moments with him in Cyprus, when she was searching for James after their first attempt at getting married went awry. The fact that Agatha feels lonely and somewhat inadequate when it comes to the more physical side of relationships is even clearer in this book than it is in There Goes the Bride, despite the fact that the latter part of that particular book is focused on nothing but her desperate need to find someone to be with, which leads her to almost marrying a man who does nothing but try and turn her into an apron-wearing housewife, something Agatha could never be especially given her lack of kitchen abilities and her desire to be at the centre of things. If you want to hear more about that book, (laughs) I'll post a link to the episode below. So, we have Agatha infatuated with murder suspect who may or may not have also murdered his first wife, Sarah. That's the cold case. We have Sibylla Trieste Perkins, who everyone actually suspects killed George's wife because she was in love with him, possibly committed suicide after the fact. Yes, she's definitely dead, but given everything else, it may in fact be murder. We have the two elderly ladies, Mrs Andrews and Mrs Jessop, meeting their unfortunate demise due to LSD-dosed marmalade, and then the unfortunate murder of the accountant, Arnold Burntweather, who worked with Reverend and Mrs Chance on the fundraiser. And then there's the disappearance of all the money that they raised. Plus, there's the rather slimy new employee at Agatha's detective agency, Jimmy Wilson. Agatha's house is broken into, George punches her in the face, and Tony dumps Bill for being too eager to please his picky mother. As I'm not going to reveal everything that happens in the book, though I think I've revealed a fair bit that doesn't affect the main plot... I am going to simply say that it's not an easy one to predict. There are so many motives, so many suspects, but it all gets resolved in the end. And because it stays focused on the characters and the core plot and leads into the next book, it doesn't feel as though the book is riddled with unnecessary storylines that go nowhere and serve no real purpose. 
If you, like me, are a fan of the TV show that was inspired by this series, then you have probably already seen the season four episodes titled A Spoonful of Poison. However, if you have not read the book, then you may well be wondering who all these additional characters are, what possible connection the four murders may have to each other, and how the entire plot was changed. All I can currently say is, I know, right? <laughs> Seriously? Well, that's not all I can say. I can tell you that the two are different enough that watching the show or reading the book does not mean you won't be able to enjoy the other. There are definitely some surprises, whatever way you happen to view them. I loved the TV episodes, but then I don't think I have watched one episode that I haven't enjoyed. Ashley Jensen isn't who I see when I read the books, but I don't know if I could imagine anyone else in the role. I prefer TV Roy to book Roy, and radio Roy, for that matter. I can't help feeling that for the radio they decided to go overblown gay stereotype, and for some reason that just feels incredibly wrong. And I know that he's meant to be the bad boy of the piece, but there's something strangely endearing about Charles Fraith. Whether he's the slightly smarmy radio version, the persistent book version or the Jason Merrill's TV version. This book first came out in 2008, and if you're at all familiar with changes in the law around that time, specifically in England, then you will notice that there are multiple mentions made regarding the fact that Agatha is less than impressed by the introduction of the ban on smoking in public places, such as pubs and clubs. Many elements of the book are pretty timeless, making for stories that could be relevant at any point in time, albeit sometimes a tiny bit dated. This one definitely introduces the This Was Written in the Early 2000s strand, purely because of the mentions of the smoking ban. All that being said... Before I get to my opinions of the book, I want to see what other people thought. So let's take a quick trip to Goodreads for a few balanced reviews. Ellie is clearly a fan and has read many books in the series. She gave this one four stars and said... A Spoonful of Poison is a recent entry in the Agatha Raisin Cozy Mystery series by M.C. Beaton. If you enjoy Agatha as much as I do, you won't be disappointed... If you've not read the series and you like humorous British cosies featuring middle-aged women, again, as I do, I urge you to do so. However, I would suggest beginning with the first in the series, or at least somewhere near the beginning, since Agatha's life has greatly evolved in some ways since she first retired from her successful public relations firm to an English village where she struggles to adjust and finds herself becoming a somewhat nicer person as well as a detective of murder crimes. Agatha does not totally change, thank goodness. She remains acerbic, sarcastic, slightly vain, and moved easily to infatuations with attractive members of the opposite sex, regardless of their suitability, or lack thereof. She is also randomly kind and self-aware. A lovely combination. I'm grateful for this series. It makes me feel good. Jo Berry, however, wasn't feeling as generous when she reviewed it, with a two-star review. I read the first four chapters, then skipped to the end, but I really think this series is stuck in a rut. The same ideas are regurgitated, and there's no passion in the writing. The crimes are weak and are only solved by a hunch from Agatha near the end. You can't make any real attempt to solve them yourself, although I don't really care enough to try now. Not that we're really here for the murders. It's Agatha Raisin and her friends we're interested in. Unfortunately, their stories are going round in circles or even going downhill. Once likeable characters are starting to irritate me. Agatha's obsession with finding a husband, Charles being a parsimonious, flaky friend, Bill Wong's awful parents. It's always the same. And we rarely hear about the inhabitants of Carsley anymore apart from Mrs. Bloxby. It was fun when it started, and Agatha Raisin and the Deadly Dance was one recent highlight that kept me a bit longer. But I'm done with this series now. So where do I fall when it comes to these books? 
am I going to sit here and tell you that I thought it was a perfect piece of prose that could have been longer and I would have enjoyed every moment of it? Or conversely, am I going to say that I am 100% done with my visits to Carsley? Here's where I get into the nitty gritty. Did I like the book? Let's start with the positives here because there are always plenty of those with any book. Actually, um, that's a bit of a lie, not any book, but most. I love the fact that Agatha is someone who, despite having quite a few faults, which I will get to, doesn't hesitate to acknowledge them. She knows that there are parts of her that aren't great, that nature is against her, and both of these things contribute to her making impulse decisions that could lead to her downfall. She's a supportive friend and likes to keep people around her that she knows she can trust. Ultimately, for all that she's vain and fully aware of her abilities and appeal, she has some frailties and vulnerabilities, and it is these which make Agatha a much more appealing and realistic character. Now, let's touch on the things that bug me. And being completely honest, most of, most of these are more to do with how she's written. In the space of a few chapters, we have Agatha saying things pettishly, waspishly, and tetchily. She's constantly portrayed as bitter, jealous, vindictive, angry, and self-obsessed. Yet, there are actions in the books that show her as being the complete opposite. She makes impulsive decisions apparently based on her jealousy of a younger woman, her protégé, Tony Gilmore. Her actual friends think that she's going to go over the edge when she finds out that her ex, James, is remarrying, and she is portrayed as pushing them away. As much as I love these books, I find these actions so frustrating because they are always attributed to her age rather than anything else. Perhaps she's had a bad day, but oh no, she's a woman in her early to mid-50s who is angry about getting older. The most irritating thing about this has to be the fact that we're made to believe that she is so old. As a woman who is well on their way to 50, I can honestly say that I find Beaton's obsession with making Agatha sound so angry about getting older quite demoralising. I didn't die the moment I hit perimenopause, and the fact that we're made to believe that this vibrant, driven, determined, and intelligent woman is anything less than those things because of her age is just wrong. Yeah, I know I've gone off on a bit of a tangent, but I am so fed up with that whole every woman who has reached middle ages, old cliche. I just had to say something. Anyway, I have to say that I did prefer this book to the last one I read, There Goes the Bride, book 20. And again, reminder, this is book 19. Do not read them in the same order as I did. But I do feel as though we're scraping just a little bit now. The earlier books in the series are much better and the TV version of this one was much more engaging, at least in my opinion. Will I read more by M.C. Beaton? I will likely go back and read some of the older ones again. My favourite remains Agatha Raisin and The Quiche of Death, the first book in the series. I really do love meeting Agatha and seeing how she develops in the books. I also like that slow build of the relationship with James, but I can't help it. Give me Charlie Fraith any day. I sort of wish she'd just have a long-term passionate thing with the Lord of the Manor. If you're looking for something like this, or you loved this and want something else, then you'll love these. It's a cosy mystery, and there are so many out there right now. I've actually just started Magpie Murders by Anthony Horowitz because I saw the TV series starring the always amazing Leslie Manville. And I'm actually looking forward to seeing if I enjoy his adult novels as much as I enjoyed the Alex Ryder series. Of course, others that you may enjoy are authors such as Agatha Christie and Richard Osman, or perhaps A Bird in the Hand by Anne Cleves, who also wrote the Vera novels. And despite the fact that it wasn't actually my cup of tea, The Maid by Nita Prowse is another that you might enjoy. While I've had some downtime from the podcast, I have not been resting on my laurels. 
I have been picking up and reading a lot of new books as well as continuing to participate in the read-along with Page Toon. Throughout May and June, I read a total of 22 books. Not bad, right? Taking me over the hill when it comes to my Goodreads target of 50. I also hit my goal for new authors, but I am still looking for more. And as well as starting Magpie Murders this week, I have also just picked up the book for next week. I have also been rather disciplined, surprisingly, when it comes to buying new books. Though I do have three brand new releases on my Kindle right now that I am slowly working my way through. That said, there is nothing like the feel of a hardback or a paperback so I am trying to keep it balanced. Though my TBR is always rather large, in fact, it takes up an entire bookcase now, I am always looking for books to add to it because I'm a masochist. So if you have any fiction recommendations you would love to hear me talk about or think I'd like to read, send me an email at notbeforecoffeepodcast at gmail.com or DM me on Twitter or Instagram and I'll be sure to take a look. We're in July. (laughs) Seriously, I am not sure how it happened. The months are just flying by, but summer has well and truly arrived. And that means many of you will be heading off on holidays, you lucky things. So if you're stuck for something new to read, or you're an airport shopper standing staring at the shelves in the duty free, let's take a look at a few of the books you may encounter. All of these books are released on the 12th or 14th of July. From Grady Hendrix, the author of The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, comes the final girls' support group. Sydney Prescott was one, as was Julie James. But Lynette Tarkington is in a support group dedicated to helping them cope with survival guilt. At least until it isn't. If you love something a little different, then this is the perfect poolside book for you. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow sounds like a quote from Shakespeare. Probably is a quote from Shakespeare. It's also the title of a book about love, friendship, betrayal and money by author Gabrielle Zevin. What happens when the body of a young British art historian is discovered during the floods in Venice in 2019. In a mystery that leads to offices of power in the city, investigator Nathan Sutherland is sent in to find out in the latest from Philip Gwynne Jones, The Angels of Venice. There's so much more to look at, but I would be here all night telling you about books such as Venomous Lump Sucker by Ned Bowman and Am I Normal by Sarah Cheney, both of which are also out this week. If you'd like to find out more about books coming out or just want to read more spoiler-free reviews, join the other bibliophiles and sign up to my newsletter. Go on, you know you want to. So, how are things in the bookish household this week? In all honesty, it's been a weird few months. I never planned on taking almost two months off from the podcast, But sometimes you just know when things aren't right. I've been feeling incredibly tired for a while, struggling to do more than get up and go to work for eight hours before collapsing on the sofa, sometimes without even the energy needed to make something to eat. So when I looked at the schedule for the summer, I thought, take some time off. At one point, I wasn't sure if I was even going to come back. I love the reading and I love talking about it, but my health was becoming a concern both mental and physical. So I took a step back and decided that a hiatus was exactly what I needed. Did I go anywhere during the six weeks I have been absent from podcast land? To be serious, I'm a hermit and I still had the nine to five to contend with. But I did read a few more books for pleasure. I picked books up I hadn't even considered. Will they be episodes? Probably not. Did I find them interesting? In some cases, yes. In some cases, they were just a momentary diversion. I read six books in one day. They were just a diversion. Anyway, I am back. I am refreshed. The podcast has had a bit of a branding overhaul and I am planning more over the next few weeks as I decide on further changes I would like to make. 
But I guess I should really talk about me, at least for a moment. Did you know that a shortage of B12 can lead to the following? Shortness of breath, tiredness, paleness of the skin, tinnitus, headaches. Welcome to my life for the last few weeks. I know that I have a B12 deficiency. It was diagnosed a few years ago. I have been getting treatment for it for a while. What I didn't realise was that if your body can't digest it and your treatment isn't frequent enough, those same symptoms come back and knock you sideways. So if I'm honest, this is really why I have been absent. Of course, as well as being absolutely drained all the time, being a lady of a certain age also means I struggle to sleep courtesy of night sweats. So a combination of these two things has been a world of wonder to experience. Disregarding all of that, I have actually been okay. The tiredness has led to irritability, which has in turn led to shortness of temper, which means I have probably been an absolute joy to be around but everything else is going well. I'm honestly glad that I made the decision early on to stick with the podcast, even when everything else was saying, you don't need it, because it was a gut reaction to something that wasn't going right in that moment. But a combination of all those things I have been experiencing physically were influencing my thinking. Funnily enough, as I was putting together the content for this week's episode, I realised that a lot of my anger at Agatha Raisin's portrayal in this particular book had a great deal to do with my own feelings on the subject of getting older. The really weird thing about getting older is that you look in the mirror and you see the grey hairs, the small wrinkles around the eyes and the mouth, and it's really difficult to recognise the person you're seeing. When I think about who I am, I am still a teenager, someone who will happily watch a bloody awful film if there's someone I deem to be nice to look at in one of the roles. I still sing along really loudly to New Kids on the Block or Debbie Gibson when I clean, as that's my cleaning playlist. And then someone will point out that these were hits over 30 years ago. And I pause for a moment and try not to cry. I guess what I'm trying to say is that though age isn't in the mind, the way you react to it is. The actions and reactions of Agatha Raisin, courtesy of her creator, were not healthy. They weren't the right way to respond to ageing. It's not so much a case of you're only as young as the person you're feeling. It's more a case of as long as you're not hurting anyone, keep on reading those comic books. Continue to enjoy your reread of Sweet Valley High if that's your chosen literature. Wear a costume to go to a midnight showing of the latest Marvel film. Don't let your age dictate how you react to the world around you. Unless you're a politician, and in that case, please get out of the pram and start running the country. I am very quickly moving towards my 100th episode, and I would love you to get involved. I'm going to be talking about must-buy authors. So if you have a must-buy an author that no matter what else is going on will always be on your pre-order list, then send me a recording letting me know who and why. You can email it to me at notbeforecoffeepodcast at gmail.com and please get it in before the 24th of July. And of course, don't forget to include who you are. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, why not share it with your friends and family and please post a star rating on Good Pods, Spotify or Podchaser. You can follow me on Twitter at being underscore bookish and on Instagram at being bookish pod. Or you can check out my website, which is actually now getting updated, beingbookish.co.uk. Well, I've got a lot to get ready for next week and the next book is calling me. So until next time, this is me saying... Farewell.